So I just put in the chat the Bitly link. If you're interested in the signed copy, it's free of Genius Makers. We're going to raffle off at the end of the talk. Uh, you have to be present to win. <laughs> Uh, you can fill out that uh, link there. And then, Sam, you can go ahead and um, introduce them now. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sam from the Duke, Duke Computer Science Students Union, and I'm joined by Doherty and also Susan Roger. We're all part of the CSSU, which is a student organization for all Duke students interested in computer science. And we regularly hold events like this for the Duke public. And we also have a event coming up in a few weeks. For It's a panel of, uh, made up of Duke grad students about how to apply for grad school, going to grad school, et cetera. And as Susan said, there will be a raffle of, uh, we will be giving away a signed copy of Kate Metz's new book. So as you can see, <laughs> we are graciously joined by Kate Metz. He's a technology correspondent with the New York Times, covering artificial intelligence, AI, wearables, cars, robotics, virtual reality, and other emerging areas. Before, he was a senior staff writer with Wired Magazine. He graduated from Duke class of 1994 with a bachelor's in English, while also taking many courses in comp sci and mathematics. Both his parents and both his sisters are also Duke alums. He's just written his first book, Genius Makers, that he will be talking about tonight. And Doherty will introduce Professor Ross Bassett. Kate Metz will be interviewed tonight by Professor Ross Barrett. He is a history professor at NCSU who got his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, worked at IBM designing memory systems for large computers, and then went on to get a PhD in history. He studies the movement of technologies and engineers across a variety of boundaries. Um, so now we can get started with the interview. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for, for coming. And uh, thank you, Cade, for writing a fascinating book. It was a, a pleasure to read and um, it was a great story. And maybe um, just in starting out, you grew up in Raleigh, um, you went to Duke, and now you're in Silicon Valley. Could you maybe uh, tell us the story of how you went from North Carolina to Silicon Valley in, in your life? Absolutely. I did grow up in, in Raleigh and uh... Um, thanks for the kind introductions. As you said in the introduction, both my parents uh, went to Duke and, and they both worked at IBM. Uh, that's actually where they met uh, on Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, so I grew up with, with technology, right? Um, my father in particular, uh, I often tell people, worked on the universal product code, the barcode on all your groceries uh, while he was at IBM. He helped test that product. And so I sort of grew up uh, with those types of stories, um, but always wanted to be a writer uh, and uh, ended up at Duke as an English major. Uh, but at the same time, I had a scholarship through IBM and I worked as a programmer testing network cards uh, of all jobs at the Research Triangle Park while I was studying English. So I always had these, these dual interests, uh, took computer science classes uh, while I was an English major and then when I moved to New York after college, um, uh, looking for a job, I found a job um, with PC Magazine, which was the, the leading computer magazine of the day. And that's where I got my start. I was a fact checker and researcher. Um, and then from there, kind of wound my way through uh, to, to Wired Magazine and then to the New York Times. And... Um... Just as a technology guy in Silicon Valley, being a reporter for the New York Times, that kind of would seem to me like being a kid in a candy store. And how do you, um, how do you decide what's important? There's so much going on there. Um, tell us what, you, what your work is like for the New York Times. When I tell people that it's really, and this, this may sound simple or overly, overly obvious, uh, but it's really about talking to people, right? You find someone that you trust, um, who knows where the change is. You're always looking for where the technological change is. Um, and you find people who see that, right, in various areas. And you talk to them every now and again, and you say, what should I be covering? Um, and they, they might bring something up, and that might lead um, 
to to a, an interesting conversation. You get to the end of the conversation and you ask this person, who else should I talk to about this? Mm-hmm. Right. And they lead you to another person you trust. And so you sort of you know build this chain of people. And at the times we often say if if you can find three examples, it's a trend, right? So if you get three people who you trust saying this is important, then you have a story. Um, so that's really what it's about. It's finding where the change is happening. And you do that through just talking to people. Yeah. How, how did you begin following this story? When did, you, when did you start? And then when did you really come to be convinced that this was important and maybe that it would be uh, book worthy, you might say? I started covering this area, this, this artificial intelligence area, when I was at Wired. And that was also our philosophy there. We had a small team, um, you know, covering, um, you know, deep technology and we couldn't cover everything. So what we did is we, we focused on the areas uh, where the change was. And right around the time I, I started at Wired, this one, um, this one idea started to work, right? The idea of a neural network, uh, a mathematical system that can learn particular tasks by analyzing data. Um, And you could see this starting to work in multiple areas and it became a full-time beat for me. Um, And, you know, over the years, I started to to build story after story. And then there was this key moment uh, when this lab in London called DeepMind, which had been acquired by Google, they, they used this idea to build a machine that could play the ancient game of Go, which is like the Eastern version of chess, uh, except it's exponentially more complex than chess. And people thought it would be decades before we could build a machine that could beat one of the world's best players at this game. And DeepMind managed to do it. Uh, They took this machine to Seoul, South Korea, uh, and they played against who was really the best player of the last decade, Lee Sedol, uh, who was Korean himself. And I was lucky enough to be there. Um, and it was, I tell everyone, it's, it's one of the most amazing weeks of my life. And I wasn't even a, a, a participant. I was just an observer. Um, you could, in Korea in particular, it was a national event. I mean, in China, it was as well and in Japan, but in Korea, where the match was, you could feel the whole country kind of um, move back and forth as the match itself moved back and forth. And I got back from Korea and that's when this book started to come together. Um, and But really where the book took off was when I realized that it was really about the people building uh, these technologies. And there were some fascinating figures, um, each fascinating in their own right, to really build a story around. Uh, and that's, in, that's where it went eventually. Yeah. It, just going backwards a, li- a little bit with um, neural networks, uh, one of the fascinating things about this is that one of the key historic figures in computer science and artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky, if not exactly a villain, is sort of a, um, a, a skeptic and a negative energy force, you might say, for, for the uh, development of, of neural networks. And could you just talk a little bit about his role in this story? And it seems like he played a role in pushing it uh, making people not believe in it and maybe even slowing this work down in some ways. It's true that the idea of a neural network, it dates all the way back to the 1950s. Uh, And a key figure then was a guy named Frank Rosenblatt. He was a University of Cornell professor and he worked at this lab in Buffalo where he actually built a neural network with an IBM machine of the day. And eventually he built his own hardware as well that could recognize printed letters. So the way a neural network works is um, you feed data into the system and it analyzes this data. It looks for patterns in the data. So, you know, the best example I always give uh, in describing this is you can, today you can take a neural network and you feed it thousands of cat photos and it can learn to recognize the patterns that define what a cat looks like. And it can learn to recognize a cat. Rosenblatt did this with printed letters, um, which are you know really relatively simple images, um, and he talked about this in the pages of the New York Times, right? My own my own paper in 1958, and there was all this hype around the idea, and you can see it in the Times story. It's astounding to see what 
Rosenblatt claims the system will do, right? He's, he's developed a system that can recognize very simple things, but he says it's going to recognize the spoken word and it's going to learn to speak on its own. And then it's going to create itself on an assembly line and fly into space and do who knows what there. And there's all this hype that builds up. And Marvin Minsky, uh, who, by the way, was a, a high school uh, classmate of, of Rosenblatt's, uh, they had this history together. And, you know, in, in the 50s, Minsky himself believed in this idea. Um, uh, and as the years went by, um, he started, like a lot of people, to see its flaws. Um, and he was one of the many people who were disappointed in its progress. And he wrote this book in the late 60s um, that pinpointed these flaws. And people point to that as, as, as a moment when, you know, the air uh, left this idea. Um, and by, you know, the late 60s and early 70s, even AI researchers, for the most part, did not believe in this idea uh, because Minsky, um, in particular, had sort of taken the air out of it. And so what brought it, what was the key moment, would you say, that brought it back that um, sort of rehabilitated neural networks? Well, what's interesting is how the, the idea would, would rise in the estimation of the field over the decades and then fall again and then rise back up. And... You know, the, the key character in the book is this guy named Jeff Hinton, uh, who was a, a British-born um, uh, computer scientist and, and psychologist and uh, kind of jack-of-all-trades who, who embraced this idea in 1971 when it was at its lowest point, when almost no one believed in this idea. He took hold of it and continued to work on it over the decades. And Another key moment comes around in the 80s uh, when he supplies a, a missing mathematical piece to this idea. Uh, he publishes this paper about a concept called backpropagation, which allowed a neural network um, to overcome some of those flaws that Minsky had pinpointed. And then you get more hype around the idea. And there are some technologies being built around that time which are impressive in their own way. Um, but again, they never quite live up to the promise. Um, we still had to wait a couple decades uh, for this idea to really pay off in about 2010. Yeah, as we talked about in the sort of prelude, it's one of the tensions in this book seems to be maybe to be a successful researcher, you need to be believe passionately in something, but at the same time, you need to be willing to change your mind sometimes as new information comes in. I mean, how do you see that play out in some of your characters? Yeah. At Jeff's uh, Hinton's lab at the University of Toronto, he eventually wound up in, in Canada. Uh, the common theme his students will tell you in his lab was old ideas are new. And what that meant was that you never gave up on an idea unless you could prove uh, that it wouldn't work. Um, and there are even moments in, this, in the path of this idea where Hinton thought um, that, that there was a proof that it wouldn't work. Um, but, but once he realized that proof was wrong, um, he kept working on it. Um, and not only that, he encouraged others around him to keep working on this idea. Um, so this kind of small group uh, of people centered on the University of Toronto and other schools in, in, in uh, Canada um, were really the centers of this idea uh, in 2010 uh, when it finally took off. Yeah. I mean, one of the other interesting things about your story is that the um, Hinton's um, co-receivers of the Turing Award, Jan LeCun and uh, Joshua Benjo, are not from, you know, what we would call top flight computer science or engineering schools. We might not think of the University of Toronto in, in that way. And, and so all of this work comes from maybe not the usual suspects, We not Stanford, not MIT. Or... You're exactly right. And in fact, not many schools you know, in the US period. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that idea that uh, all the talent when this started to work and it became so interesting to the biggest companies um, on earth, right? Mm -hmm. Google and Facebook and Amazon, they suddenly wanted the talent and it was not in the US. Mm -hmm. It was in Canada, it was in Europe. Um, it was uh, 
you know, abroad, um, you know, there were a couple of exceptions, you know, Jan LeCun at NYU, but, but he was French, right? Um, this, is this, this is a common story in the science and tech field, of course, that the, the U.S. relies on immigrants yeah. uh, to build this technology. And that is certainly the case here. Not only was it relying on immigrants, you know, when the idea started to work, it really had to look outside its borders and pull people, pull people in as it realized the importance of this one idea. So do you think that's, I mean, it, do you, how do you, is it a weakness or the strength of the American system? Do you think that it relies on immigrants? I mean, again, that it's not the big name schools, but then it is able to pull these people, these people into its uh, force field, you might say. I mean, I think it's a strength. And I think we, you know, it's part of what we need to think about um, as we look ahead is that that has always been a strength and it needs to continue to be a strength. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, there's a lot of talk about competing uh, with China in this field. And you know, you know, in some ways, you know, we are competing, but we also need to realize that um, the U.S. relies on that immigrant talent, including uh, Chinese talent. It's very important to the field, mm -hmm. um, and that's why there's been a lot of concern in recent years um, because of, of you know the ebb and flow of uh, immigration policy. Right? There's a lot of worry that. Um, you know, we can shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak, um, if, if we bar that talent um, from coming here. Do you, um, just following up on this, I mean, do you see, I mean, part of, again, your story takes place in Silicon Valley, but also in Toronto, London, and so on. Do you see these Silicon Valley companies as being interested or willing to just set up labs and if America is not welcoming to immigrants and set up labs offshore essentially and use this talent in other countries? It's another good point, right? And I, I've seen this firsthand. I wrote a story a couple of years ago when I visited the UK and I went to Cambridge. Um, I'd been in London um, visiting an important lab there, but then I took the train up to Cambridge and I hadn't been there uh, in, in several years. And I got off the train and I started walking towards Cambridge, the University of Cambridge, and you get two blocks, um, you know, down the sidewalk and there's Amazon. And you, you walk a couple blocks further and there's Microsoft. And I get to the end of the road and there's Apple who had acquired a Cambridge startup in this field. And, and then there was a, a new building that was going up and it turns out that was Samsung, mm -hmm. right? So there was all this talent um, in this very field in Cambridge, and you could see these, you know, these giant companies, um, you know, literally in real time setting up shop um, to make use of that talent. Um, Jan LeCun, who's a major character in this book, who we talked about, is from Paris. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook now has a lab in Paris. Uh, uh, Jeff Hinton, who we talked about, is in Toronto. Google has a lab in Toronto. Um, this is the way it works, right? These are, we think of these sometimes as American companies, Google and, and Facebook and, and Amazon and others. They're really, they're really more than that, right? And they have a presence all over the globe and they're always looking for how they can expand into these important areas, not only for the talent, but for the markets, right? So they can serve those particular markets. So one of the... Um, the there's one point in your book where one of one of your characters says we're now in a era where data is the coin of the realm essentially and one one interesting part of your story is that we have these you know in the subtitle of your book you call them mavericks we might call them sort of marginal figures uh, but then they interest Google and Facebook and Google and Facebook uh, sort of uh, gobble up these companies um, would you say um, is it possible? And it seems from your story that by having access to data, Google and Facebook have the ability to sort of play in this space, dominate this space. Is it possible for other people to make a contribution or is this now a world that, uh, is this Google, Google's and Facebook's world and we just sort of uh, live in it? There are ways for others to make make a contribution in certain areas, but there are places where it really is about the data. Like the, the one thing um, that's really working well now and that a lot of people see is the near future of this are these giant, they call them language models. Um, 
this lab in San Francisco called OpenAI, which was founded by Elon Musk, among, among others, has a system now called GPT-3. And the way it works, it's just a giant neural network. It spends literally months um, analyzing uh, digital text. So digital books, Wikipedia articles, all sorts of other content from the internet. And it learns to recognize the patterns in that text. And in doing that, it learns the way that language is pieced together. And it's, it's really changing a lot of things. The Google search engine, it's leading to better and better chat bots or systems that can carry on a conversation. It's really important to all these companies. That type of thing where the data is so, you know, the amount of data needed is so enormous and the amount of processing power needed to, to crunch it all. Um, that's, that's only inside these big companies, right? And, and they're the ones that, are, that can really play in that area. Mm -hmm. Now, as time goes on, that, that sort of technology kind of trickles down, so to speak, you know, uh, processing power gets cheaper. You can do things that you couldn't do in years past if you're a small shop, but it's a, also a real concern, mm -hmm. particularly when you compare industry to academia. Right? It's hard in academia to do that work because you don't, you don't have access to that computing power that you have inside a giant company like Google. One thing you said I just want to maybe touch on and, and bring out, and maybe many people in the audience will know this already, but where do we see, where do we see the results of your story in our daily life? Um, I, I kind of have a sense that we see it but we, maybe we don't always know that we're seeing it. And maybe you could highlight where this has changed things that we do every day. It's really true. It's, you know, it's, it's everywhere you turn, right? It's this one idea that, that drives so many of these services that we use on a daily basis. So, you know, when you power up your iPhone and you ask Siri something, it's a neural network that recognizes your voice, right? Um, when you open up Facebook, and you post an image and it can recognize the face uh, in the image, that's a neural network. Um, it's fundamental to self-driving cars, um, which so many companies around the globe are trying to develop. That's how a, a self-driving car sees pedestrians on the sidewalk or recognizes a, a stop sign. Um, you know, we're now seeing, I just wrote a piece about self-flying drones with so many startups uh, here in California are, are building for the military. This type of technology is fundamental to that. We talked about those giant language models. Well, those are already helping uh, the Google search engine um, understand your queries better and, and, and give you what, you what you want. I did a, um, yesterday I did a, a radio interview uh, with uh, kind of a science radio show in, in Utah. And the host was talking about how amazed she is that Google Translate works so well. Like she's a Spanish speaker herself. And she said, years ago, I would use it and it, it, it was almost useless, she said. But now uh, the translation is in the Spanish is almost perfect. Well, that's because we now have neural networks doing that. And essentially you, you have English um, and you have Spanish translations of that English in, in enormous you know, uh, amounts and you feed that into a neural network and it learns how to do that translation. And now that translation service, which I use all the time um, as a reporter, it really does work incredibly well. And it's because of that one idea. Um, to what extent do you think, you talk about how Google developed specialized um, chips to sort of run um, on, uh, to run neural networks. To what extent do you think is this a Moore's Law story that this is a story about the increasing power of, of integrated circuits and that makes possible things that weren't possible before? Well, the reason this idea never worked over you know, 50 years and then suddenly started to work in 2010 was because of two things. The data, which we talked about, you needed the internet to come along and kind of give us all the data we would need, but you also need the processing power. Um, but what's really interesting is that you, know, you talk about Moore's law, like the notion that every 18 months um, we get we get you know more trans, you know, do we double the number of transistors on a chip, we get double the power essentially from each chip. You know, that has started to slow down recently, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened was is that people um, in and around, you know, 
uh, Jeff Hinton's lab in Toronto and um, at another lab in, in Stan at Stanford University here in California, they realized that graphics chips, so chips that had been built to render graphics for video games, as it turns out, they're really good at processing the math um, inside a neural network. And so what, what happened was is that the progress with the CPUs, right, the chips at the core of your computer server or your laptop, the progress has started to slow down there. Um, but what you can do is you can take these specialized chips like a GPU and you can apply them to these new tasks. And that's when the neural networks took off is when they realized that they could take these graphics chips and apply them uh, to the problem. And now you get companies like Google, as you mentioned, building chips specifically for neural networks. Um, and that, um, that can improve the performance even more. And now you have companies, not only large companies, but startups all across the world, here and in China, other places, the UK, building chips just for training a neural network. And so the hope is that that will bring even more processing power uh, to this field. So in the New York Times a few years ago, you wrote a fascinating story about a, a dinner between uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and about Elon Musk's um, concerns about artificial intelligence and the threat that it posed to, to the world. And so one of the fascinating parts of your book is that there's this tension between people who think all of this is nothing, you know, a game isn't real life, and then people who think that humanity is in danger because of of these things and we're in danger of having the computers take over. Could you just talk a little bit about, about that tension and some of these different views that people have about the future? Absolutely. And, you know, the way I, I think about this and, and try to lay it out in the book is that, you know, we have all these areas where the technology is really working well today that we just talked about, right? And that's one thing. This notion that we can build a system that can do anything the human brain can do and then might spin outside of our control and somehow destroy humanity, that's something different, right? There are people in the field um, and really talented, really important people who believe that that is coming, right? The stated mission of the DeepMind Lab, which is now owned by Google's parent company in London, the stated mission of OpenAI which we talked about, which was founded in part by Elon Musk, their stated mission is to build that machine that can do anything the human brain can do. But what you need to understand is that they don't quite know how to get there, right? And they have theories about how to get there. And, and in general ways, they talk about, well, if we can get enough data, you know, enough, uh, enough data that can describe everything that happens in the world, and you feed that into a, a neural network, then you can build, you know, AGI. Well, that that's... It's easier said than done, let's say. And um, uh, certainly these, these labs are important. Um, let's not discount what they're doing for the real world today, but that notion is something else. Um, and what fascinates me, and I hope this comes across in the book, is how that belief, you know, it's really like the, the chapter that focuses on this is called religion. It is a belief in this distant idea. And it's fascinating how it can spread from person to person. And then you get someone like Elon Musk talking about it. And then it really spreads, right? He's got, he's got quite a megaphone, that guy. Yeah. One of the uh, interesting sort of things in this section is when you mention how Larry Page, I think he calls uh, Elon Musk specious for um, not sort of accepting the possibility of silicon life forms or, um, right. and um, so do you think he really imagines that we will have silicon life forms that will be our equals? It's really hard to know. You, you can never get inside someone's head, I often say, right? And even, you know, they talk about that dinner between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. And I've talked to multiple people who were at the dinner, right? Who heard everything that was said. Even they aren't sure what Elon Musk believes, right? Is he just saying this? Is it this, you know, form of PR, even at this private dinner? Or does he really believe that? Does Larry Page really believe that only good will come out of this and that we really need, you know, this world that's populated by, you know, machines alongside humans or like Elon Musk that we're going to somehow put a chip in our brain and we're going to be, you know, half machine. Is that really what they want? 
Um, I don't think anybody knows, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's fundamental. You can't, you can't know what someone else believes, truthfully. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the intriguing things about this story and about your book is sort of the, the social implications of it. In some sense, some of these people are thinking that it's going to be sort of general intelligence, but it all is sort of grounded and it has racial and gender implications. And there, are, there are, is this, uh, you talk about a, uh, the dominance of white dudes is sometimes seen as a problem. So could you talk about sort of the racial and gender implications of, uh, of artificial intelligence in this way? It's you, know, you see this play out in the arc of the book, right? So many of the people we've talked about um, are white men. Uh, and the reason that's important is that this is about choosing data that goes in into the system, right? And if you're a white man like myself, you, you have a particular world view and you're going to choose particular types of data. And sometimes you're not going to see your blind spots. And so there's this moment in the book uh, where people start to realize that systems that are being built, but also that have been deployed, exhibit bias against women and people of color, for instance, because they are not represented in the data. Uh, and that's a real problem that the industry is, is still struggling with. Those giant language models that we talked about, you know, they're learning from the internet. We all know that the internet can be biased, right? We all know the internet is full of toxic language and we're building systems that can mimic you know, that data and what that means that they can spew toxic language. Um, and that's why these, these language models um, are, are, are really, you know, they're a real battleground at the moment, right? They're so important to the future of these companies but they show this bias inherently and, and they can spew hate speech. And as people say, we need to stop and think about this. There are also forces that are pushing these technologies forward and trying to get them out into the marketplace. And it's become a real source of tension in the industry. So do you think the rush to get things to the marketplace and the <laughs> desire to monetize all this research is making people under, underestimate some of the uh, some of the biases that are inherent in this kind of work? I think so. I mean, what I often say is that anyone who has lived through the past four years knows the problems that technology can bring, right? And a lot of these technologies that we have today, which have helped, you know, exacerbate some of our problems as a, as a society are much simpler than these technologies. We, you know, what happens when the technologies are more powerful and more complex? You know, hopefully, um, uh, you know, this will teach us as a whole to be more cautious, right? And, and hopefully we can slow down uh, some of the speed um, and slow down some of those attitudes that just want to push it out. Uh, we'll see. You know, it's funny how, you know, you look at, you know, look back at the book and what happens, it's, it, you know, how history just sort of repeats itself over and over again in so many ways. We tend to do that too, right, as humans. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about, I guess, just being here in the triangle and having worked at IBM myself, that I, it's kind of striking that IBM isn't, doesn't seem to be a player in your story. And we hear a lot about, you know, Watson, Watson B, you know, Ken Jennings and Jeopardy and so on. And where, where is IBM and Watson in this re in relation to your story? It's really interesting. It, it's it's largely because IBM made its bet too early, right? Um, you know, I talk about this in the book, but the neural network is so interesting because it learns, and it's different than the way we built AI in the past, right? Um, the way we built it in the past, it was called symbolic AI. In a lot of ways, we still use that, those ideas, but essentially what it is, is in the past, if you wanted to build um, you know, technology, build an AI system, you put a bunch of engineers in a room and you had them code the rules of it, you know, line by line, rule by rule. If you're gonna build a system that can identify a cat or identify a spoken word, it's so hard to code all those rules, right? We just could never get there. Um, and that's essentially the way 
that IBM started to build something like, you know, it's Watson technology. As they started to tackle some of these areas, it was, the technology was at a different place. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until after they had sort of gotten the ball rolling that the neural network started to work. And it, the neural network has real implications in a lot of these areas that IBM was focused on, uh, like drug discovery, right? And other forms of he healthcare, when it comes to recognizing, um, you know, what's going on in a medical scan, which can be a really powerful thing. These are all kind of things that IBM was talking about, but it, or unfortunately they just, they, they got there too early, right? Um, but it's also interesting how like companies just respond to things differently. You know, Jeff Hinton and his students, as they got speech recognition working with a neural network, one of the places they went to to implement this was IBM, right? So IBM was in the mix there, but what you also needed, in, in addition to this speech recognition technology, you needed a platform where you could distribute it, right? Google had Android. They could get it out into the world. IBM didn't have that. Microsoft didn't even have that. So a lot of it's about like, seeing the opportunity and taking it, but it's also about having the infrastructure, right? That you need to deploy it. That seems to be one of the things in your story that Google has the ability to get almost any, any of these products out quickly that you sort of talk about um, the deep mind work in, uh, in London and they had a lot of these ideas, but they couldn't get them out into the world and actually make money out of it. And Google was able to do that. That's exactly right. Um, you know, a lot of it is about, um, you know, luck, you know, where you are at any given time. Uh, but it's also about seeing where things are moving and, and jumping on it. What I, I, what I am fascinated by also is that these companies really develop their own personalities uh, and they, they keep those personalities as they get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in, in my story where in the book where, you know, the, the companies react in very different ways uh, to what's going on. Um, and there's this fascinating like anecdote in the book where um, this Microsoft executive named Chi Lu, right? He, he decides he's gonna change the direction of this company uh, by building and, and learning to ride this backwards bike, right? He's gonna, he's gonna unlearn the way you ride a bike and learn to ride this new bike. And that's gonna be a metaphor for all of Microsoft that, for how it can change the, the direction. And I'm not going to give you the punchline. You got to read the book for the punchline yeah. because it, it's just too good. Yeah, for sure. But one of the things that as a historian, I kind of feel badly about, I think today we know Google, we know Apple, but people know very few about very few engineers. And I, I sometimes have students in my classes name engineers and they, they could name Thomas Edison or, but don't go very far. What do you, and so one of the great things is you tell us the story of a lot of these engineers. What do you think we sort of buy by having these stories of these individual engineers and sort of knowing Jeff Hinton and John LeCun and, and these other people? Well, you know, it goes back to my father, right? Uh, you know, he was an electrical engineer. Um, he studied uh, doubly at Duke and he got his master's degree. And you know, he used to joke, um, you know, he said the joke in, in the electrical engineering part, department was um, doubly, you can't spell geek without it, right? And there's this sort of this stereotype about engineers. And, but I've always thought that that was an untapped thing that, you know, people inherently are interesting, whatever field they work in. And certainly in computer science, it's, it's a creative field. Right, I, you know, I, and I really believe in that because I work in a similar field where you're creating. And certainly as an engineer and a, and a programmer, um, you are being creative. And what I loved about this story is that as I built this story around people in the field, right? Engineers, programmers, um, uh, and others, you know, sort of swirling around this, not only were they interesting, but they were all interesting in their own particular way, right? Jan LeCun is completely different than Jeff Hinton, let me tell you. And that comes out in the story. Um, and you know, as I went along, um, not only were they interesting, um, but they were so incredibly funny in places. Like they're just astoundingly funny characters. You know, Jeff Hinton being, being um, you know, example number one. Um, but others like you know this guy Ian Goodfellow, 
um, who uh, went to Google and OpenAI, and now he's at Apple. Um, he's the inventor of a technology called the GAN, which is fundamental to the, um, these systems creating images and videos on their own. Um, he is absolutely hysterical. And there's this very funny story in the, in the book about how he creates the GAN. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to do that, right, to shine a light on these engineers and these programmers, because um, I, know, I know a lot of people like that, and that's what I spend my, so many of my days doing is talking to these people. Um, I, I know how interesting uh, they are, and I want to convey that in the, in the book. Yeah, so often I find when you study these great figures, you often find they're very flawed and have, um, I, I think of um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs and some of the uh, not so great things we learn about, about Steve Jobs. Um, from your work, can you be a nice um, and, and successful engineer, do you think, or any of your people you, that you, you've talked to them and you come away saying, hey, this is really a nice person, you know, this is a, a decent person, or do you have to be so aggressive to be successful that you have to push everyone else out of the way? You do not, I mean, as an engineer, I mean, Hinton um, is an incredible person on many levels. And you can just see this in all the people that I would interview who work with him over the years and who I talk to. Like they, they talk about that guy in, in the most amazing terms. Um, you know, he is not just a nice guy, um, but an incredibly giving um, person who they all feel um, they owe a debt to, right? And there are, there are people like that, others like that in the book. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, that's something different, right? You talk about Steve Jobs, right? That's sort of side of him. It's really, it's really, it's real and it is intense and it's part of his success. And, you know, that's almost fundamental to it. You see this in Silicon Valley all the time. You have to have this you know, this, this drive um, that isn't always about being nice. And that pops up in the book too, right? Um, so you get, again, you get all kinds. Yeah. So one last question before I open it up to um, questions from the audience. Tell us a little bit what it was like being in Korea for the Deep Go, uh, the Deep Mind Google, uh, the Deep Mind Go um, challenge. What That must have been a really electric sort of environment. Uh, and, um, were you confident that um, the Deep Mind team was going to win? It's it's really interesting. I I pitched the story to my editors at Wired magazine, and they liked the idea. and And I and I had said at the end that uh, the Deep Mind machine was likely to win. And one of my editors actually changed that. He didn't believe it, right? And he he actually he actually says, "No, no, no, it's not going to win." But it's still a good story. <laughs> And I said, you got to trust me on this, because what was so interesting is that DeepMind had built this system and played one of the top European players in private, and they released the results. They had, and they had beaten this, this European champion handily, but he, he was not at the level of the top players in the world. So there's this big gap. So even Go players thought, well, once it gets to Korea, it's going to lose because it's, you know, we can see the level it's, it's at. But I, I still remember talking to Demis Asabas, the leader of the DeepMind Lab, the morning of the first match, right? And what he talked about, which was obvious before, is that they had spent the months in between training the system, right? Essentially, it would train by um, playing game after game against itself, like millions of games against itself. Well, they had all these, they had about three months to train more and more, which meant that it was going to learn more and more. And its level was going to go up. And so you could just see the confidence um, in him that morning. Um, and it was, it was breathtaking to watch. What I found out later is that there was also a flaw in the system that they knew about. Um, and, and that left them on edge. And you kind of see that in the story as well. And there is this great moment you know, where Lee Seidel, the human player, comes back and wins the game. So, I mean... I mean, really, I can't tell you how you could feel the whole country, you know, um, not only focus on this game, but really kind of sway back and forth. My father always talked about seeing Ali Frazier at Reynolds Coliseum in Raleigh 
um, and you on closed circuit. And you, as you know, Ali would go up, everybody would sway one way, and then Frazier would go up, and everybody would swing the other. And it was like that. And then you know, Deep Mind wins the first two games, and you could feel the air like just really go out of this whole country. It was really upsetting, even to me. And, but then you could you could feel the happiness, right? You know, being injected into the you know these same people when Lee Seidel came back and won. It was really an amazing thing. Well, thank uh, thank you, Kate. I mean, this again, your book has been fascinating. It's been a and it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. And, and I guess I'll turn it over to Susan for the raffle now. Is that how we should yeah. go, Susan? Uh, yeah. So um, if you uh, haven't done so quickly. <laughs> I put the bit.ly link in the chat and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, the screen here and here's the names. These are just your names. I'm not showing your contact info uh, of the people that have filled it out. And um, I'm going to shuffle these names like I, I Kate actually give me a number two, three or four and I'm going to shuffle the names that many times and then whoever's at the top gets the book. So two, three or four times, Kate, you get the let's, pick. Let's do three. Okay, three. All right. So all the names are in there. Uh, we have, oh, some people are still filling it out. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> okay, so we have 23 names in there because uh, it starts at one. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, he said three, I'm gonna shuffle it three times. So let's see, uh, here we go. This is the first time. Uh, this is the second time. And this is the third time. Uh, Ashil, you get the book. <laughs> so I will contact you with your contact info. I have the book here uh, and he has signed it and I will uh, get up with you, Ashil, and you get the book. So now we'll open it up for um, questions and you can either um, uh, put your question in the chat. There's already a couple of questions in the chat. I don't, Ross, can you see those? Uh, yeah. uh, the first one starts like I think with Jayesh at 7.28 p.m. Um, and then you can also raise your hand if you want to speak, and I'll, I'll unmute you. Uh, there's a virtual hand. If you do that, um, you could do that, too. So, uh, Kate, do you want me to read the question out loud? Or and um, should we sure. go that way? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So, um, again, um, this is a question from um, Jayesh. What is your opinion on companies such as Amazon and Microsoft who are now starting to build processors in-house rather than ordering them from Intel? And how do you think this is going to impact the future of machine learning in the hardware sphere? It's a really important area that doesn't get talked about as much as it probably should. And it's really changing the chip industry. And um, you're right, it's, it's, it's eating into uh, the market share of, of Intel. That you know, All these companies are now building their own chips. Um, one thing that's interesting though is that you know, it was it was those graphics chips that really you know made the, that idea of a neural network work, and that's what people really used um, for many years. And then Google built its own chip called a TPU, um, and Google really uses that internally a lot, and and others can use it. And you see that a lot in the research papers, um, in you know in the literature in this area. What you don't see yet are, are other chips. Um, what you really need is you need software um, around those chips that's easy to use. Um, the GPUs had that, um, and they still have that, of course. The, the newer chips aren't used as much um, because the software ecosystem isn't there. You need easy ways to use them, and I, I'm still waiting for that to happen. But I think I think it's going to happen, and, it, and it's not just Amazon um, and, and the big companies that are building these chips. A lot of startups are. Uh, both here in the U.S. and and abroad in the U.K., uh, GraphCore is a company in the U.K., and then of course in China, uh, there are many companies that are working on this. So um, our next question: um, Any takes on Timnit Gebru and Margaret Mitchell with that ethical AI? And it, there's a reference to your Monday article that uh, in the Times. Yeah, that Monday article was an excerpt in part from the book. Um, it, it sort of took what what happened in the book and applied it to this, this situation. Um, I really see that as um, just one example of what's gonna go on across the industry, what is going on across the industry, where you have that same sort of tension 
where you have people like Tim Neat and Meg who are pointing out these issues of bias um, and other ethical issues. Um, and sometimes that clashes uh, with these large companies. You see it in the book where those two people actually clash with Amazon. And it's funny to me um, how you know, people will say, you know, did your book, you know, did you finish your book too early? All this has happened at Google. Well, it's really a replay of what happens in the book with Amazon and those two. And then it happened at their own company, um, right? It's really indicative of what's going on. And I think it's something that all these companies are going to struggle with. Yeah, and Ashil, you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question. You got your hand raised. Yes, hi. Um, thanks so much for being here. And obviously I'm hype about the book. Um, <laughs> I was kind of wondering, um, you know, to what extent are some of these problems with AI and machine learning, like, you know, bias and the spread of misinformation and, you know, kind of the black box stuff, like, to what extent are those just technical issues that are just going to require, like, you know, a bit of time and, and research and money to solve versus do you think that there are any, like, inherent AI problems? Um, and if so, what are those? And and are those going to require some different types of solution, like, you know, policy or legal frameworks? Yeah, some of them are inherent. Like, you talk about the black box problem. We haven't talked about that much. And that's the notion that, you know, these systems train on so much data that you and I can't wrap our heads around all that data. So we can't really know what's going on in the neural network. We, we don't really know how it's going to behave, right? You know, a lot of people are working on that. Um, they, you know, they spend their careers on it. A lot of it's really interesting work trying to explain what happens in a neural network. But I wonder if that's ever possible, right? The, the, the amount of data is so large, we could never wrap our heads around that. And, and the models are getting bigger. Um, so I think the, the solution there is different. I think it's about you build your neural network and then you test it rigorously. And you have to find out the places where it's going to break down and deal with it that way. Um, it's very similar in the bias field, right? You need so much data to train these things. Um, it's going to have that bias in it. It's going to have those flaws in it. And so then it becomes about test. Um, how does it behave in the real world? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to deal with that, um, but I think we're going we're gonna to have to. So the, the technical solutions in both those cases are not obvious, right? And it's not clear that we can get there just with time. Um, we have to think harder about it and maybe think about new solutions. A lot of people want to find solutions outside of this type of machine learning, right? Maybe we, we build systems that learn in a different way so that they don't have those problems. Uh, we're not quite sure how to get there yet. Yeah, we have three more message, three uh, more questions in the chat now. And is uh, is Li Deng here? Um, someone mentioned the possibility that he might be here, who's a character in the in the story. I think I saw his name. Um, Li Deng is another great character in the book. Uh, you know, he worked at Microsoft for many years, and there's this key moment where he happens to run into Jeff Hinton um, at this uh, machine learning conference uh, in, uh, outside of Vancouver. Uh, and they talk. And then about six months later, he brings Jeff Hinton to the lab at Microsoft to apply neural networks to speech recognition. Um, it, it's really a, a great story. And um, in addition to that, um, Lee pops up in the opening uh, of the book, which is this incredible moment where, where Jeff Hinton essentially auctions his services off to the highest bidder, and you get these giant companies bidding for his services. Um, and Lee Dang is not only um, you know, in that prologue, um, but he was a great help in, in, in um, as I tried to piece this story together. It's an incredible story to the point where you know, I've spent years making sure every little bit in that story is, is accurate. And I'm still, you know, I still wonder if it's true because it's just such a, such a great story. And I owe, uh, I owe Lee um, oh. many thanks for that. Oh, thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, I'm here. Uh -huh. I'm listening to, uh, thank you very much for interviewing me. Uh, I love the story you were you telling. It was just wonderful. I just enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you on many levels, Lee. So, uh, Kate, we have another question. We always think of AI benefiting neuroscientists and helping to understand how the brain works. But I'm wondering if neuroscience can help develop a better AI. 
I think so. And that's actually another theme in the book that you, you, you see neuroscience and psychology, by the way, and artificial intelligence, they're all sort of new fields, you know, coming to the fore at the same time. And there's all this overlap. Um, and Hinton, from the beginning, Jeff Hinton, from the beginning, early 70s, he believed in that idea that you could build a system in the image of, a, of the brain. That's why it's called a neural network. It's supposed to mimic the brain. And if you talk to anybody who knows Hinton, there are these moments, you know, along the way where he'll, he'll run into the room and he'll say, I understand how the brain works and here's how it works. And here's how we're going to use that to build machines. Right. And then, you know, it doesn't quite work out, but then, you know, a year later, he's got a new theory, but that really drives him. And it, and it, and it goes both ways, right? It's about understanding how the brain works and applying that to machine learning, but also about you know, seeing the way these machines work and maybe that can help us understand the brain. I mean, one thing you've got to realize is that we do not know how the brain works. Um, and so we can't really build a system that works like the brain, um, but, but you get this, this situation where one field can feed the other. And uh, I think, it happened then, and it, it, certainly it continues to happen. We, we have a question about who do you think is ahead in the self-driving car race, Tesla, Waymo, et cetera. And I guess, do you think it will be decisive um, in self-driving cars? Um, it will be a decisive advantage for the company that is, um, has the most advanced research in neural networks uh, and deep learning to, that will enable them to have an advantage in self-driving cars, do you think? I think it's hard to tell who's ahead and how it's going to play out because I, I still think it's early. And that's that's one thing I can say is that we, there's been all this promise around self-driving cars and it's not just not quite there yet, right? It's, it's hard. A neural network works really well in certain areas when it comes to recognizing what's going on. It doesn't work as well when it comes to predicting what's going to happen, right? It's hard for these cars to deal with uncertainty. Um, what is interesting though is that uh, Waymo, for instance, and Tesla have very different approaches. Um, Elon Musk and Tesla very much believe in this idea that you can build this giant neural network that does everything, right? Um, that's sort of what they're betting on. Um, but that's a long-term bet. Um, we're not to the point where a car can learn everything in that way. That's, that's going to take some doing. So we have uh, a, a question about your future. If you were to write another book, what would you be interested in covering? Are there untold AI or other emerging tech stories that you would like to cover or would you touch on something completely different? Well, there, there is you know, a topic I've been talking with my editor about. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you what that is yet. I better keep, keep it to myself. Um, but there's so much to cover in this area. I'm certainly going to keep covering it for the times. Um, there's no doubt about that. All right, it's eight o'clock, so that's perfect timing. <laughs> I think you got all the questions in there. Sure did. Thank you so much to everyone. Uh, Susan, uh, Ross, uh, that was a great interview, and thanks for all the questions. Um, and I was so glad I was able to send, send a book and it'll find a home um, <laughs> at Duke. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate you uh, reaching out to us and uh, scheduling this talk. Uh, I think uh, the students have gotten a lot out of it, and uh, it was very enjoyable. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you to all of you. Have a good night. All right. Thanks, everybody.